the journey will not be easy. Storm swirls round the dragon's tower like a shroud. The dragon may be dead, but in its ashes, I fear something else has awoken. You will fight for every step. You must reach the tower, learn what became of our warrior, face what lurks within. All it takes is that soft, mushy feeling as your foot lands on something hot, warm, wet, and very smelly to realise that your puppy has left you a thoughtful present in the middle of the living room floor. That's kind of how Remnant from the Ashes was to me. I looked down all of a sudden and there it was, like that sock you never knew you had, stinking of vinegar and stomach acid, left to cool on the only rug in the house while the guilty party shuffled off to shout at some birds. If or when you come to play Remnant, you'll probably get insane indie game vibes. There's a dime a dozen Souls likes on Steam and this one reeks of it. Sure, it's got enough boss variety to fly well over the rip-off radar, but most enemies are very obvious reskins of one another. Stone, please. And graphically it screams purchased Unity assets. Sure, it was produced by Gunfire Games, a studio owned by but operating independently of THQ Nordic, but if that qualifies it as an indie developer, then so is From Software. That does beg the question though, where do the assumptions come from? The quality of the game, most likely. Oh, burn. But seriously, this game is so slapped together that it's wearing its mum's heels to take the bins out. It's got more bugs than Salazar's basement and reeks of an indie studio's first crack at a big boy title, even after two DLC and countless patches. When I popped back in over a year later to grab footage for this video, I felt like a weary parent. Disappointed, but not surprised. In three-person co-op, every loading screen on Earth was an eternal loading screen, unless two of us quit the entire application and rejoined the host on the other side of the door. My start menu was completely broken. I couldn't interact with anything on it, it was all greyed out and all menu items were replaced with lorem ipsum text. I couldn't tab between menus, change my equipment, level up, or quit the game. This problem bled into all user interfaces, meaning I couldn't interact with anything that needed a key card or other item, I couldn't upgrade my armour or weapons, or buy anything. Even stuff the devs claimed had been fixed. We had a frame rate freeze every single time an elite enemy died, and the game was frantically working to spawn loot like an elderly woman looking for Vaseline in her purse. I stepped on a teleporter and just fucking died, which kind of ruined the grand atmosphere of the labyrinth for us. I mean, besides the fact that I paid full price for it and it takes 15 pounds of sellotape, the precise positioning of the planet, and a rain dance just to work properly for an extended period of time. But also because it's got a really, really good premise. This is a game you really want to love, but depending on the feast of bugs you get, that might hinder your ability to feel or even make you drop the game altogether. I mean, Dark Souls with guns might sound like a shallow descriptor, but honestly, it's fair. You run from checkpoint to checkpoint, checkpoints restore health and equipment, the enemies respawn, weapons and armour upgrade with classic plus values, and bosses are probably the biggest draw of the game. The game does try to be all cryptic with lore by taking all the useful exposition and hiding it in a notebook in the middle of a map, so it doesn't really work, but it's a good effort. That being said, Remnant isn't one of those games that suck relentless Dark Souls dig. It tries and succeeds in bringing so much new shit to the table. A gruelling survival mode where the player goes up against randomly selected bosses from the game, new difficulty modes ranging between Baby's First Battle and Literal Hell, and most importantly, procedural generation. Remnant's main selling point is random world generation. Game structure, bosses, side quests, NPCs, and items are selected at random and scattered through the map like a glass you've dropped and smashed on your hallway floor. It takes a meticulous hoovering before you're sure it's safe enough to be pelting around in your socks. 
but let's dial it back a bit. Remnant from the Ashes is actually the second installment in a really vague Ashes series by Gunfire Games, except the first in the series, Kronos, was a VR game and an Oculus exclusive, so only a fraction of the people who've played Remnant will have ever heard of Kronos, let alone played it. I'm in that latter bundle, and sure, I could follow the storyline of Remnant well enough without context, except for, oh, I don't know, several insanely important moments and boss encounters that I apparently needed to play the original to understand. Sure, at time of writing, Kronos is about to be ported to the PlayStation 4 and 5, but that's two years on, and it doesn't mean that Remnant couldn't be written with these gaps of knowledge in mind. It's too little too late, really. The premise, as a first-time player will come to understand, is that you're living in a dystopian future, which is starting to hit a little bit too close to home in our humble year of 2020, in the wake of a planet-wide invasion by strange plant aliens, the Root, who consume and assimilate all living things, hopping between dimensions and planets like angry frogs on the lily pad of reality. You find your character on some small boat, sleeping directly on their backpack like it's no big thing, as this whole initial monologue plays cryptically in the background. I think it's about what happened in the previous game, but it's anyone's guess, really. Your character seems to think that, by reaching a tower, they'll stop the invasion. But before you hear anything useful, you get decimated by a tidal wave and wake up in a ramshackle house somehow, nowhere near a body of water, and then get pelted with tutorial tips and realise that the game has started. It's a, there's an ending to this but it's okay if you die segment, and regardless of what happens you wake up in the Nexus, I mean, Ward 13, sorry. This is the hub area, the Firelink Shrine if you will, but unlike Dark Souls, none of the resident waifus have their feet out, so there's no point. Besides this seething disappointment, you'll meet a bunch of NPCs, most of which are irrelevant one-liners who huddle around barrel fires and shiver a bit, basically rendering a whole third of the base completely useless. Some are vendors, there's a guy who upgrades weapons and armour, a woman who sells mods and boss weapons, a fellow who sells skins, and a guy who sells basic consumables. Some NPCs also have quests if you fancy completion, you big loser. This is where the central storyline takes a hit. Yes, I do mean the moment you have control of your character. Literally the second you take your first steps, you're told to go looking for some guy called Andrew Ford, or the founder, but no one knows where he is or what he's doing, which is a fantastic start. So you decide to start your search on Earth, which is kind of a big search radius, but you have to start somewhere. You head down to Earth in all its post-route devastation, derelict buildings and rusted cars and big clawing roots that stretch across the environment like a Lego set in fishnet stockings to try and find some evidence of his location. Well, his wife is here, but he's clearly forgotten about her being that she's been stuck here in agony for decades, but that's water under the bridge for old Ford. Oh my god, is that why he's called Ford? Someone called Varty. There are sewer sections, because they're a legal requirement, obviously, and you'll find your first opportunities of side quests and mini bosses, with the possibility to find some really cool ones. Letho's Lab is a personal favourite, an easily missable but super cool branch of the game that took me 15 years of re-rolls to finally find. You rock up in some old as balls laboratory, and after a bit of keycard and power related mumbo jumbo, might find yourself in a big room with a strange chamber that allows you to teleport around the lab. But if you're some nerd who likes to read, and you check the notes around the lab, mess around with the settings on the teleporter a little bit, and say, accidentally find yourself in the room below the teleporter, well, maybe you'll find something you shouldn't. Anyway, Rip Hyde is the mini boss squatting at the end of this segment, some big root monster that clones itself on the go, and is always a tough fight no matter how prepared you are. Mini bosses are always bigger, stronger versions of elite enemies, the enemies that do a weird high-pitched chime when they spawn nearby with their own health bar and additional enemies. Shroud and Gorfist are two key examples of mandatory bosses you have to fight on Earth, and you'll probably hear the most conflicting stuff ever about these guys. Some people are going to tell you that these bosses were so hard that they put the game down and they never played it again. Some people are going to be confused by that, because they found them really easy. Both of them are right. You see, every mini boss in Remnant has a randomly assigned buff, and those buffs can completely make or break the first few hours of your game. You've got Hearty, which gives bosses more HP, and basically lengthens the amount of time you you need to stay alive and completely depletes your ammo. You've got Skullcracker, during which the boss and their ads will stagger you with every hit they do, often causing hair-tearing stunlock frustration, and you've got Vicious Enemies, which basically just do more damage, and Regenerator, which, as the name implies, slowly regenerates health and, depending on the boss, plants you in a near unwinnable DPS standoff. But you can be sure that the people who rage quit within the first few hours got one of two options, Enchanter Shroud or Enchanter Gorfist. The shit in my soup here is that Enchanter buffed bosses drop a tactical nuke 
look on your exact position every few seconds, sending an explosion of spores up in your face if you forget to dodge, you're cornered by all the enemies in the room, or just stood there picking your nose. You'll either die in two hits from the explosions, or catch Root Rot, one of the game's succulent status effects. In some twisted sense of humour, the Enchanter buff can only be assigned to mini-bosses on Earth, i.e. the first few bosses you'll ever meet. Often, the Remnant subreddit will see new players post inquiring about why the game is so hard, why this Enchanter Shroud is so impossible, and everyone will gently encourage them to re-roll their entire campaign, like solemnly suffocating a sick family member with a pillow. It's for the best. Still, it's not too far through Earth until you reach the Labyrinth, a place I've no idea how anyone missed, considering the sheer magnitude of its introduction. But considering its later irrelevance to the plot, it could easily be replaced by a big white room with some doors and a bathroom attendant. At least it looks cool. One casual death on the teleporter later and you'll find yourself face to face with the Labyrinth Keeper, who basically tells you to fuck off and figure things out on your own, and then never speaks to you again. So you just head on your way to the next map in the game, Rome, and Rome has fallen. Get it? Like Rome? Like Rome? Like the ancient empire of Rome and how it fell? And how they've named this place Rome too? Because it was an ancient empire and it fell. Okay, sorry, I didn't think you'd have gotten it, but it's good, right? Rome might be the place you start to figure out that the worlds have alternative final bosses. You see, you'll need to go and find a special key to open the Black Sun Gate, and if you get a boss called the Harrow, you might be surprised to find that they drop it. I didn't get a trophy for this boss like I did with every other boss, and didn't really understand where this came from. I went on my way with the key in a bucket of confusion. Upon checking the trophy list, I found out I could have earned a reward for beating the Claviger, literally meaning Keeper of the Keys, Custodian, Warden, the Key Master, and everything kind of made a bit more sense. The Harrow felt like just another side quest and so randomly out of place that it threw me off, as I kept expecting to find the real final boss of Rome just around the corner. You get directed to the Undying King, or Eslan as he's known to his D&D group, an ill-fated king who, very logically and reasonably, nuked his entire civilization to the brink of extinction to avoid the invasion of the Root, leaving them brutally disfigured and reduced to their most base, primitive form, attacking you with spears and rocks and snot magic. What a silly goose. It's an amazing world though. Ancient super soldiers haunt abandoned underground ruins flying Doritos scream at you for getting too close, and the cracked ground below your feet reveals a twisted web of metal pipes and girders reaching down into the dust clouds deep below the crust of the earth. It's a shame you can't ask Eslan why he's such a moronic wet wipe, but you can tell him to eat your fat ass and then fight him to the death, or politely nod and listen to his weird request for a guardian heart before he slaps you on the bum and sends you on your way. Unlike Earth and Rome, Corsus actually wants the route to invade. Yep. Corsus, a sprawling maze of swampland, has been slowly conquered by a parasitical hive mind called the Iskal, headed by the bootylicious Iskal Queen, who has enslaved all the locals and turned them into her simps, I mean, her thralls. They stagger around the swamps, blistered and agonised, their brains turn to mush, but most people pretend they don't notice the rampant colonisation because she's got a smash and pair. If you get some delicious RNG, you can spawn the final member of this dead race, a single swamp elf who hides away in the last bastion of safety, the graveyard. Oh, Oh, sorry, my notes are smudged. The graveyard. If you're an absolute blind suck up, an utter bitch baby, a thirsty simpering maniac, you can have the option to poison her on behalf of the Iskull Queen. And no, I didn't. The Swamp Elf is actually a great example of some of the utter planetary alignments required to get certain events to spawn. Three conditions need to be met for this event to be possible. The Iskull Queen needs to have spawned in the overworld, the Swamp Queen needs to have spawned in the graveyard, and the special parasite inflicting enemies need to have spawned as well, which on a rolled map is asking quite a lot, but if you're lucky enough to meet all three, you get the fantastic opportunity to sell out the last bastion of a proud race for a shit ring, a boring trait, and a whiff of pussy. Go you. You can actually become infected with a parasite if you try really really hard to be, by purposefully failing a quick time event after being grabbed by a rare enemy. You can have constant health regeneration in exchange for not being able to use any healing items. It's quite a unique status effect, and one of many added by Remnant on top of the familiar faces of burn and bleed. Some are quite experimental and pretty hit or miss, but they at least tried something new, and you have to give them credit for that. As I said before, Earth introduces root rot, which you have to contract by inhaling the spore explosions cast by many of the bloated seed enemies. Root rot causes your character to stop moving every few seconds to sheath their weapon, cough daintily into their sleeve, and grab their weapon again, usually right as a deadly attack comes down on their head. Rome introduces radiation, which halves your stamina but little else, but due to glitches abound, might randomly insta-kill you without a chance to be resurrected. Thanks a lot, Gunfire 
games. Corrosion reduces your armor rating, turning you into the squishiest adventurer ever, and Geisha introduces Shock, which directs all lightning attacks directly to you. So if you're a dodge god, it won't matter and you might not even notice. Finally, Frostbite was introduced in the Subject 2923 DLC, which basically clouds your vision and makes you slow for a while. Sometimes the game will even glitch and cloud your vision even after you've healed and removed the status effect. Devastating. You tread through courses, find a huge moth in the bath, squash it, and then realise you can't go any further. And then you realise that the moth dropped the guardian heart you've been looking for. Huh, okay. So I guess we can take it back to the Undying King. Hey! Did you seriously give that to the Iskal Queen? She's enslaved an entire civilization of innocence with a horrible parasite, and you're just gonna give her what she wants? Oh, it's because she's fit? Oh, okay, that's cool. That's fair, go ahead. Although I don't really get why we need to visit these random places. The storytelling in each individual level is great, even the way the world is structured tells an awesome story. The game is way less about individual playthroughs than it is about replayability. RNG, boss variations, side quests and item rewards such as mods and traits form the central mechanic, not the plot, so it's easy to ignore how bafflingly tenuous it is. Speaking of traits, before the Swamps of Courses update, there was a really specific amount of traits and armor sets in the game. 30 traits and 10 armor sets, which coincidentally was the exact specific number you'd need for their associated trophies. This meant that for the OGs, a group of which I was almost a member, you had to find and successfully complete every single side quest and laboriously respawn them even if you failed. Eventually, they increased the number of available armor sets and traits so you don't have to do all the shitty subquests if you don't fancy them, which is perfect for a lazy sack of shit like myself. But the most comprehensive addition by the Swaps of Courses update was the crashes. It feels like every single time Remnant got a patch, swathes and swathes more problems will suddenly near their heads. The Remnant subreddit would suddenly be littered with bug reports, ranging from the measly to the mighty. After one patch, everyone starting a new character would have their game crash on class select. Myself and my co-op mates went from one crash roughly every six hours to one crash roughly every two hours. The devs might busy themselves nerfing and buffing weapons and mods, tweaking armor stats and altering enemy damage, HP and abilities, but the game breaking bugs still persisted. You'd almost think it was a Bethesda product. Anyway, once you've decided which sketchy ruler to hand this insanely powerful relic over to, you'll be directed to Yasha, a picturesque jungle full of warring tribes. Cool. This level has that interesting historical tourist trope in that you kind of stumble through it, occasionally blundering into the middle of someone else's battle, defending yourself in a wild panic, and then being given accolades worthy of the greatest warrior. I like that you don't take charge of the rebellion like some dinky hero fantasy, and instead just trip and fall through the world and happen to find victory on the way. Here you find Andrew Ford. Yep, remember him? The guy I mentioned all the way at the start of this review? Did you forget? Yeah, so did I. He's just sat here in Yasha, chilling in a prison cell for some reason. You open the door, he gives you a key, and then he fucks off and pre-DLC release, you would never see him again. Now the DLC is out, he'll haunt Ward 13 like a sad ghost. Make sure to pop by and say hello on your way into the basement to fight the, oh, the final boss? Yuri Levitation Toll makes a surprise debut here as the Dreamer. Just some dude in a weird headset you probably won't realise is the final boss until you've triggered the cutscene and sat through his boring speech. Gunfire Games seems to have made a valiant attempt at the Dark Souls approach of delivering exposition, mostly indirectly with an emphasis on NPC dialogue, randomly abandoned journals, and items descriptions, but you never see a dreamer until now. Sure, you can fuck about downstairs in the basement, looking at weird set pieces and reading pages upon pages of lore on terminals, but is it really how you want to tell me what's going on, Gunfire? Two hours later. And sure, you might hear about Dreamers and Guardians, but you never see one. And that visual disconnect really throws you when you finally find the final boss. A lot of games think they can replicate Dark Souls just by leaving key information on the back of a box of cereal, but even soul storytelling isn't that vague. Even in the first cutscene, you're given a pretty abridged history of the world. Dragons, flame, disparity, lords, the pygmy, you know. You get a snappy intro for all the main bosses of the game. Nito, the Witch of Isolith, Seath and Gwyn. Finally, you see the Hollows, and then your shriveled little salami self. You know who you are, why you are, and where you are, in time and in space. In Remnant, you're just some dickhead in a boat. You don't even know where you are. You also don't know when you are. Some dragon apparently came by recently, but some flimsy myth is no basis for understanding the world you're in. What relevance does it actually have for a new player? What does it actually tell you about the story you're about to embark on? Why bother to include an introductory cutscene if you have zero intention of introducing players to the game? Even Dark Souls 3, a sequel of sorts to Dark Souls 1, sets the scene as though you've never played a Souls game before, because from 
Kutuzov knows that situating character is so crucial. Where is the dreamer? The nightmare? How are we supposed to know what the final boss looks like? It's not a spoiler because it's hardly relevant to the actual story and there's no payoff when you see him draped in his chair like a fancy throw. Guardians are also a pretty big part of Remnant that can be easily ignored, but might have gone a long way to actually tell you what the fuck is happening here. I don't know. Call me needy, but being appropriately informed goes a long way to my engagement with the story. I didn't know what was going on and I didn't really give a shit as a result. But yes, anyway, final boss. The dreamer in the nightmare is a two-stage boss fight featuring the ludicrously easy dreamer and the extremely unforgiving nightmare, pre-patch especially. You can only damage the nightmare after he drops you into the danger zone and you kill enough enemies to lower his defence far enough to pass a DPS check. To make matters worse, your health is constantly dropping here and you go up against increasingly tough enemies, with familiar old faces like Gorfist and Shroud eventually spawning in the utter orgy of destruction. Once you've got your kills and bail, you have to absolutely rain down hellfire on nightmare's weak spot until he staggers or nothing will happen. I'm not really sure how solo melee builds or single fire weapon builds are supposed to claw their way through this fight, but in a three person team the fight is trivial, especially post patch wherein all of you now get sucked into the silly zone, not just one player. Still, the impression on whether or not this game is insanely hard or insanely easy is always going to come from the random selection of bosses you get thrown at, and so many remnant elitists with over 2000 clocked hours are going to make fun of you for not being able to solo difficult bosses first time. Just ignore them, hold it in, politely excuse yourself to the bathroom, and let it all out. It's alright. Uh, it's alright, there, there. You might get some easy bosses like the Canker and Stormcaller, unless you get the glitch I keep getting, where upon crossing through the boss fog into Stormcaller's arena, you just die on the spot without a chance to be resurrected. Some bosses you don't even need to fight if you use your honeyed words. Some bosses like the Thrall and the Clavager are only hard because they bring all their mates along and then take turns curb stomping you like the kids in the upper years at school. And their ads get the same buff as them, so you can be in for a world of pain depending on what the game decides to throw at you. Variety is the spice of Remnant, and although world bosses can't get buffed, they still have mad replayability because each world boss can drop one of two weapons depending on how you kill them. Our sweet resident Sif clone, the Ravager, dwells at the arse end of Yasha in his little cave. You can slap him awake and then smack some scent into him, or you can put his paw in a bucket of room temperature water and wait for him to wake himself up. Then he'll just chat to you, which is okay, if a bit rude and condescending. I need not your thanks. Alright, alright, Ravager, fine, I won't say thanks, but you're making a bigger deal out of this than you need to. Other notable mentions include Singe, who can be beaten with or without destroying the tail for a different goodie bag each time, the Ent, whose legs you can cripple or not, the Unclean One, who you can fight in his basement if you like getting shit rewards, the Iskal Queen, whose melee phase you can skip entirely by dropping a bit of rock on her head at the cost of one of the best rewards in the game, and the Totem Father, whose melee and ranged attack can be toggled by smacking the totem outside the boss fight, each with a different reward. Reward. The only downside to all this re-rolling malarkey is Simulacrum, the titanite slab of Remnant, which spawns just as randomly as everything else except it's basically mandatory for a new player, and some people can arrive at the final boss having not found a single one through the whole game. Simulacrum is some all-powerful gunk that you can trade for a permanent increase to your heals, or the final upgrade on any weapon, so it's quite important, and you might not find any. All of the rewards and boss variations are mutually exclusive too, so if you want to collect everything you have to re-roll the world twice per boss. and complete the requirements as you go. There are mods to collect too, which you can affix to your weapon as you go and get some amazing new buffs and attacks. You can tell that bosses and mods are the game's bread and butter, being that with the Swamps of Courses update, a new game mode was added, Survival. And honestly, it's the tit. It's the absolute best part of the game, especially if you have teammates to work with. Upon entering Survival, you spawn into some weird mystic marketplace, except all the vendors are just big rocks with glowing symbols on them, which to be fair does cut down on the small talk significantly. You're there in nothing but your undies, so you pelt around to each shop and try and grab as much as you can. You'll probably only have enough cash for a few things, never a full set, so you have to choose carefully and prioritise min-maxing your build. I don't recommend the solo because it's really fucking hard. Every few minutes the world levels up around you, so you have to move quickly and be efficient between bosses or you'll get surrounded by ridiculously strong enemies. The order goes two side bosses, one world boss, so you might get Mauler, Riphide and then the Harrow. And if you're not prepared for each boss as you find them, you'll get sent packing. 
One mistake will kill you, which is fine if you have a handy friend, lover or colleague nearby to resurrect you, but solo runs require perfection, and higher boss streaks are feats I've only ever seen the sweatiest players manage, so don't be discouraged if you're not making it far on your own. I played with two friends who were well acquainted with the game by this point, and even with seamless communication and careful teamwork, it must have taken us 40 hours to finally get a 10 boss streak, and we're still friends now, which is outrageously unheard of. You get awarded with these adorable little style points for bosses you kill, that you can cash in with this adorable little vendor called Whispers to grab skins for your armor sets and look adorable. One trophy requires you to get 45 individual skin pieces, which asks for something like 600 style points? It took aeons to collect them, but honestly it was so fun, especially going for them at the same time as boss streaks. Even with our practice and success, some bosses still absolutely wrecked us every single time. We never, ever, ever beat Azilis, the world boss of courses, no matter how hard we tried or what we brought to the table. Rip Eyed was a battle we probably won one in five attempts at, and Dream Eater was a constant roadblock until the final few streak attempts when we finally got the hang of him. But honestly, it was bugs and glitches that killed us more than anything else. The Stormcaller's boss fog always killed me, meaning we were stripped back to a two-man team from the second the fight started. A busted pipe and the Harrow's arena insta-killed all three of us, even after we beat the harrow and were just walking to the next crystal. The Barb Terror, a boss that can extend barbs from the walls to kill you in single player, never ever once released those barbs during survival mode, in the tens of times we fought him. Except once, during one fight, after several streams worth of attempts, he randomly used the barbs and we all instantly died. So the question I have is, was it a glitch that he never used them in the first place in survival? Was he never supposed to use them in the first place and it was a glitch that he did use them? He never did it again after that, but I always wondered. Bug or feature? Speaking of glitches, did I ever tell you about the final DLC, Subject 2923? I mean, in its credit, it does start off quite strong. Like that insanely devout Christian girl in your class, it does make a really good impression before it descends into complete batshittery. You plonk down into this creepy abandoned farmstead in the dead of night. The silence is thick and dead, lying over the land like a still corpse, when all of a sudden the root begins to emerge from the trees all around you, staggering over to you like hordes of wooden zombies. You grab your gun and fire into the crowds, delaying them only momentarily and sprint off into the night in terror, and then immediately find the exit. So we had a bit of an RNG problem in our first visit to this DLC. We managed to spawn probably the shortest possible version of the Farmstead map with no side quests whatsoever, although I think there is only one side quest you can get here, which leads me to believe this place was woefully unfinished anyway, and walked around the corner to find ourselves at the conclusion of the map with the weird ladder that looks interactive but isn't. We just hopped into the portal and fucked off in an anticlimax of such magnitude that I felt my balls wrinkle and fall away like dried prunes. About 15 seconds after you load the DLC, you're already dropping into Ward Prime, the centerpiece of this DLC and honestly the best part of it. This is where my hopes, foolishly, really started to rise. There's a puzzle involving a grid of five numbers and letters that I left to my teammates, so I'm actually none the wiser about solving it, plus an awesome new mechanic wherein you travel between two versions of the ward, the normal version of the ward where ghosts roam the corridors but doors are impassable, and the other world version of the ward, where the ghosts are corporeal and aggressive and chase you relentlessly while you rush to open doors and complete puzzles with piss flying down your pants leg. It required a good deal of teamwork to understand together, and I really felt like this DLC was going to be a master class, the best of the remnant gameplay. And then we got to reason. <laughs> it's flashing in my face like give me epilepsy. It's crazy. Oh look, it's a reskin of the jungle enemy. Yeah, I got deep fried. Goodness. By something, I don't know what. This is... Uh oh. Oh my god, my game just crashed! Oh, fuck! Hey, my game crashed! Oh, for fuck's sake! <laughs> Wait, I should... Well, I, I should have some... Like, yeah, should somehow oh my god, I can just see some rat walking off in the distance! Oh yeah! Yeah, the enemies are moving at like one frame. N not even per second, just one frame. Oh, your character is stuck with a bottle. That's why. I'm stuck with a bottle, I can't change weapon, I can't use an item. Okay, I've frozen on my uh my 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 menu. My menu I've frozen. I guess oh my god! To... The fucking Laura Mipsum text, the flavour text is there, can you see that? Oh my god. Okay, I think I've got a permanent frozen screen. I can't press anything. I'm trying to kill self and I can't do it. Wait, so well, are you stuck as well or can you move? I can move, I just can't see. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, remember when Matt died because she walked into a boss room? Remember oh, when the oh. um, the Barb's terror glitched so that his boss fight went as it should, 
and we all got spiked to death. I got into the menu and didn't crash. I did it and it crashed. Uh, you have to kill me. <laughs> so me and Will can never go into our menus. <laughs> yep. I'm, I'm stuck at the... I, I fucking knew it when you were sitting down there like, this is not right. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> Will's stuck. Oh it's yeah, gonna... get the enemy on him. Oh, it's gonna fuck this. It's gonna fuck it. <laughs> <sighs> We cannot even kill him because he's immortal. No, we have to sit here. And my sound is glitching the fuck out as well, it's great. What's happening? It just sounds like, you know when you get like a Skype call that's breaking down? Alright, my, my game is frozen, can you please kill me? I'm guessing. Oh! I hear noise! There we go. No more in sync. Oh, how will I give that up? Oh, we just found the root source. Okay, easy. I so will follow one of you. <laughs> Really? What? I didn't see that. Oh, yes. Well, I'm looking at the face and I just saw you not fall to the ground. <laughs> no. Are, dead? are we ready or not yet? Yes, we're ready, we're ready. Okay, Will's dead probably, or one of you. This is so fucked. This is so fucked. Okay, I can describe what I'm seeing. She we're back in the place we found the snow portal. Right. And she's here trying to is, the portal's now red. Right. And she just tried to open it just for us. So right. we can go in. Okay. To like the source of the root. Okay. And we're in. We, we just walked in. I'm in some weird swirling vortex. Me too. And okay, now we just move, move through. We on Earth, looks like. Something's speaking to us. Oh, it's a. Oh, it's a. What the fuck is this? Ugh. It looks like a. Celestial emissary, but more with with more eyes. Oh no, well, never mind. It, what the fuck is this? It's like a massive tentacle with a mouth and tentacles coming out of it. Okay, it's throwing some rocks, the crystals that we use to transport. And we're fighting. Will revive at stone? Of course he is. I've died as well, apparently. And my game just crashed. Never mind. I'm alive. I'm dead. <laughs> well, let's, let's try again. I I can't see anything. My game crashed. Oh, for fuck's sake! I swear, you know what I'm thinking? They did. They made what? the multiplayer game. Never tested the multiplayer. And we're gonna finish this trophy list, and then we're gonna put this game away forever. First part of the game in the ward, really good, like really smooth. You you follow the clues around. You figure out what you've missed. You know you there's like this winding trail around the lab. The nightmare mode thing like works really well, and it, it's just like this really smooth. Uh, it just it just makes sense and it's fun. And then you get to like the ice place and it's just like waves of enemies on the same map over and over again, bugged to shit. It just doesn't work. And all the glitches just start to come out of the out of the out of the woodwork. Literally unplayable, as you can see. Like literally unplayable. Like there's so many times where, if 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 we weren't on stream, we probably would have given up. Um, it's crashed twice. No, it's crashed three times. We just walk through. Oh, you you want to pit in the sky as well? Brilliant. I'm, the reason I'm so annoyed is because I really like this game. You know what? You know I had a black screen because that transition never stopped. The cutscene. <laughs> right. Well, here we go. Oh, oh wow. Well, okay. okay. I think my game crashed. No, never mind. I'm alive. Because I tried to roll through them, but I actually um, ran out of iframes just as I was like. Oh. Oh. oh! My, game, my game lags every like twenty seconds. I did not get hit by that. I'm sorry. I know I praised the individual world building in the main game, but it's absent here and woefully underwhelming. The lore of reason is that there are rodent enemies that want to hunt you, and that's basically all they care about. There's something going on with slaves and slavers, but I didn't pay much attention to all that. It's pretty dead, all things considered. Reason just overall feels unfinished, like the end of Robert Webb's biography. Come on, Rob. It's the first book I bought in years. I can tell you slapped that final chapter together the night before your extended deadline. The locations are listed on the teleport screen as things like snow and forest in 
comparison to Rome's Gate of the Black Sun and Throne of the Undying King, which just makes me feel like there were placeholders that the devs have got to swap out and then just kind of hope no one would notice. The interesting gimmick of each world fell by the wayside. We were just put up against hordes and hordes of high level enemies with little intrigue or visual storytelling. Just the same barren ice island surrounded by sea. The fight seemed almost unbalanced. I was level 500 with fully upgraded armor and weapons and still find the sheer number of enemies to be overwhelming. We got through it fine, but I was just left with the feeling that the combat encounters hadn't been tested. They felt unbalanced in a way I can't quite put my finger on. After a very promising first half, I felt disappointed with the copy pasted enemies just being thrown at you relentlessly. Reason really wets the whistle with the insane Shadow of the Colossus type entity that you see early on and then occasionally throughout the very bare bones story. This huge imposing idol is teased in the trailer and I feel strongly that it was supposed to be part of a boss fight or set piece but ends up just dying in a cutscene like a bit of environmental decoration. It just served to ferry an NPC around and look visually interesting so you'd probably get the same emotional impact if it was replaced with a Fiat Panda. Speaking of boss fights, the ones we had were completely obliterated by glitches. A certain Tian the Assassin spawned into his arena and then immediately glitched off the platform and died and this was post patch and Harsgard, the final boss of the game as a whole, saw more glitches than anything I've ever seen in a game of my life and I've played Skyrim. The opening cutscene for this boss fight didn't work for myself and another co-op party member. We saw nothing but a black screen and we had to have the cutscene awkwardly described to us by the host while we waited to see if our game would just blue screen. At this point two of us fell through the map and needed to be resurrected then when we dropped into the final fight a bullet hell experience with an emphasis on the hell since the screen froze for a few seconds every few seconds but we still took damage and could die during that time and so ended up just butting our heads against this boss for hours. When we respawned and dropped into the boss fight it would just immediately start without any scene transition and when we got the boss down to phase two he would just switch phases in a single frame without even a cut to black. One of the only trophies introduced with this DLC was also broken from launch. The trophy required you to make a deal with a merchant called Seabum, which when I googled it I learned was the name for croppings of a particular kind of acne, so thanks for that gunfire. At which point you could go into the back room of this ship, past this suspiciously ripped bodyguard, and grab an armor set from the back. The trophy was supposed to trigger as you grabbed the armor set, but the wires got crossed apparently and the trophy was broken, and it stayed broken for weeks and weeks and weeks, maybe even months, with not a word from the devs that they planned to fix it, rendering the 100% unobtainable for a long time. I can't even make a joke here because the game is the joke, there's nothing more to add. The studio's handling of bugs and glitches is probably the main reason that I soured on the game so badly. I just felt bitter about it. I kept a keen eye on their Twitter feed and the Remnant subreddit due to the sheer number of game-breaking bugs which cropped up after new DLC or patches were released, prompting swarms of bug reports. Get it? Swarms of bug reports? But, and Gunfire Games would ignore them, completely. On the day of release for Subject 2923, reports started flying in about the broken C-bomb trophy, permanent status effects meaning the screen was completely blocked out by ice and more. And all Gunfire did was post screenshots of streamers they'd sponsored to play the game and retweeted the tinned compliments paid by those sponsored streamers. After the release of the Swamps of Courses DLC, when no new player could get past class selection without the game crashing, Gunfire did the same, and not a single bug report was acknowledged or replied to, just radio silence. I just watched their feed flood with reports of bugs and questions on when a patch might be released, which went unanswered for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks as save files corrupted and play sessions crashed hourly. It didn't really cultivate an atmosphere of feeling heard. No one expected a fix right now, right this minute, but customers did want to know when to expect to be able to play the game and got absolutely nothing back. I don't mind waiting for fixes, but I want to be communicated with. We sat there waiting for the most basic patch without a word from the studio for almost two months. That's a long time to just trust that things are going to be fixed by a company that has failed to address the most of the original game bugs. Now that's not to say everyone's experience with the game was bad. You might be furiously drafting a comment right now to let me know that your experience was bug free or thereabouts, or at least no bugs that stopped you from playing the game, and that's fair, that's valid. I'm glad you had a good time with the game and I'm glad that you got your money's worth, but my experience was absolutely dragged down by bugs and I don't know a single person who wasn't affected by glitches and crashes of varying rampancy. Like workplace banter, exercise or a strict diet, Remnant from the Ashes is an experience that I really really wanted to love, but I couldn't, because it was just too shit. I definitely viewed this game with rose tinted glasses in the months after I finished it. Besides our sad stint in the final DLC, our tireless teamwork in survival mode was the enduring memory for me and I really missed that pure elation. I thought about it so much and was so happy when I realised I'd have an excuse to play through the game again for this video. And then I came back and literally every moment of gameplay was impacted by at least one glitch which made it borderline unplayable and it was a slog again. So many bugs that patch notes claim to have addressed were just rearing their heads left right and centre and just why haven't these problems been patched? I feel like the studio has just thrown out the trash and now they're moving on to the next biggest thing. Come on Gunfire, heard of quality control? Thanks for watching my humble little video essay. 
please like and subscribe if you haven't already and leave your thoughts on the game down below. Thank you to